Thank you all for joining us tonight for the Aspen Virtual Think Tank Session 5. Tonight we're talking about minimally invasive spine and we will give everybody just about two minutes to log on and then we will begin the program. Again, we're gonna begin the program in two minutes. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We will be starting the program at 6.02 Eastern, 3.02 Pacific to give people time to log on. I'm Dr. Tim Deer. And I'm Dr. Dawood Syed. And we're excited to be hosting the American Society of Pain and Neurosciences annual virtual conference, broadcast live from Nashville, Tennessee on September 18th through the 20th. As we come together in Nashville, we'll be addressing several issues that are important to our members and to future members. Things such as minimally invasive procedures for the spine, proper methods of patient selection for interventional pain techniques, and most importantly, safety and efficacy of patients going forward as we progress the field, make things less invasive, more cost-effective, and get better outcomes. And we want you to join us in what will promise to be the marquee event of the year in the field of pain and neuroscience. Register now to join us. Oh, welcome. Uh, hello, Dalwood. Hey, Tim, how are you? Doing well. I'm glad everyone could join us tonight. Uh, the last day of the Think Tank, um, which began as a small little project in West Virginia years ago with 10 people, and now has grown to over about a thousand people over the last few nights. So, uh, what's on store tonight, Dawood? Yeah, so this is our closing session of the Think Tank. You know, I think it's been robust and very comprehensive. And this last session today is going to be focused on minimally invasive spine. So, I think, you know, for me personally, this has been kind of what's my when I look at how my practice has changed is how much more um, things we're doing in the spine that are considered, you know, minimally invasive surgical procedures. So today we're going to have uh, the Boston Scientific and slash Vertiflex team talking about interspinous spacers, their evolving role in spinal stenosis, as well as the Vertos medical team uh, and their group of uh, key opinion leaders talking about redefining the minimally invasive lumbar decompress uh, decompression procedure. And then we'll conclude with two really interesting products and companies in our uh, Shark Tank sessions. No, that's great. We'll, we'll finish exactly at two hours, right on time. And you know, I'm glad you could join us tonight, everyone. We have several hundred people watching this uh, on the video tape delay, and then yourself watching here live. So uh, with that, um, we, we're evolving. We're making things less invasive, with less complications, uh, and hopefully with better outcomes. Dawa, do you want to introduce the first session? Yeah, so it's really a power, powerhouse uh, session here led by uh, Dr. Pankaj Mehta, Michael Esposito, and Dr. Stephen Falowski. They're going to be talking about interspinous spacers or the vertif uh, vertiflexor superior procedure in the role of spinal stenosis. All right, gentlemen, take it away. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Tim and uh, Wood. Uh, great introduction, as always. Uh, it's nice to be uh, bringing us home now at the end of the uh, Think Tank after after two weeks. Highly successful, thanks to all the work uh, by you two. Um, and it's great to actually open up now uh, with, with Vertiflex, a, a great device for minimally invasive option, everything that we, we look for um, in the interventional pain space that, that offers great options for our patients. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick off uh, this half hour session uh, by first talking about uh, one is the, the prevalence of uh, lumbar spinal stenosis. The second is, is where are these patients uh, in, the, in the treatment paradigm with other physicians and then kind of lead into where does Vertiflex fit into the treatment algorithm? So I'm going to take you across that in the next few slides. I think before we get into that, it's first important to realize the epidemiology of lumbar spinal stenosis. It is one, one of the most common disorders that we treat in the United States. Uh, the majority of people we treat also with chronic pain have some element of lumbar spinal stenosis. 
we have an aging population, uh, thanks to the baby boomers going strong, uh, thanks to great medicine and medical care that we have uh, keeping people alive longer. But what that also means is now we're also obtaining more MRIs uh, in older patients, and we're starting to see more of the diagnosis of lumbar spinal stenosis. We're now also able to offer these patients uh, treatment options, even though they are an aging population and something that we may not have diagnosed previously. Right now, there's over 6.3 million patients suffering from just moderate uh, lumbar spinal stenosis with symptoms of neurogenic claudication. We make that diagnosis in three to 400,000 uh, patients each year. So you can imagine how this is growing on top of each other. And this is a very large patient population that is highly undertreated. Now, what's interesting about this is when we look at these numbers with lumbar spinal stenosis, we first start looking at how many spinal surgeries are actually performed specifically for lumbar, lumbar spinal stenosis. And interestingly enough, there's only a few hundred thousand uh, surgeries performed. So what is happening to these 6.3 million patients who are symptomatic from lumbar spinal stenosis? We know there's about a million epidural steroid injections that are performed, but yet we still have a very uh, large population of patients with neurogenic claudication as well as pain. So there's these, this patient population is highly undertreated. And I think part of that reason is because they're in this, what we're calling carousel of pain. These patients are bouncing around from different positions, just looking for relief of what they have. And ultimately it can start with epidural steroid injections, opioids, uh, but then they end up at the primary care physician's office, which they're lucky if they get sent to an interventional pain physician. A lot of times they'll get sent directly to the surgeon who may feel that it's too early in the treatment algorithm or too late in the treatment algorithm for them and send them back to the primary care doctor who potentially sends them to an interventional pain physician. And it's this cycle that happens with these patients constantly looking for some type of relief for what they have. So when we look at the treatment algorithm now, so now we have a good understanding of the prevalence, we have a good understanding of where these patients are in the system and how they're being undertreated. So what are the treatment options? Well, it starts with conservative measures or non-operative measures, which as we know is NSAIDs, muscle relaxants, physical therapy, epidural steroid injections can also include opioids, which we know we're also trying to avoid uh, after this op opioid epidemic that we've had now for several years. And I think we're doing a great job of starting to better treat these patients without opioids. But then previously, the flip side of that was the only other option was surgery, open decompression surgery, open decompression and fusion surgery. There wasn't many options in between to try to take care of these patients, especially address the structural pathology that they have, which is the spinal stenosis. Now we have the ability to introduce an indirect decompression or the intraspinous spacer, which is where VertiFlex comes into play. Previously, we didn't have these options. Even the spinal surgery options that were considered less invasive were usually open surgical type procedures. Uh, most people are most uh, familiar with those type of procedures, which were not very uh, minimally invasive, such as like the X-stop procedure. So moving on to the next slide, what we'll see is when we take it through this uh, treatment algorithm, so you have the non-operative care, which is usually the mild stenosis patients, don't have any pathology such as a, uh, a spondy, and then you move on to the patients who have started to have progression. So now they're in that mild to moderate category, maybe even the moderate to severe spinal stenosis category, can include all three, meaning central, lateral, and pyramidal stenosis, uh, have less than a grade one spondy, but maybe starting to develop an anthrothesis or retrolisthesis. That's where the VertiFlex procedure comes in. That's the idea of this minimally invasive procedure that doesn't require open removal of bone or open removal of bone with a uh, fusion, which is where we get into the severe category. Now, when you look at this uh, progression or treatment algorithm, it's important to realize that VertiFlex is actually used mostly on patients who are not surgical candidates. So what that means is they're in that mild, mild to moderate category of spinal stenosis. They may have central, lateral, or pyramidal stenosis, but symptoms of neurogenic claudication. However, the surgeon may think that they're too early in the uh, in their pathology or their symptomatology to intervene with an open procedure. That is a perfect opportunity to introduce VertiFlex to these patients with the hope of actually preventing them from moving on to need further spine surgery. The other side of that equation is the patients who have a lot of medical comorbidities, uh, advanced age. Those are also the patients who are gonna be turned down for surgery as not being surgical candidates. Those are also now great candidates for the 
the VertiFlex device. So what's interesting is now, it's important to realize that by offering this device to your patients, you're not necessarily stepping on the surgeon's toes. In fact, it, it actually works in collaboration with them because it's usually going to be before uh, they would be surgical candidates or when they're no longer surgical candidates. Uh, next slide. So some of the uh, important features I think about this is that, and this is what I, I usually talk with interventional pain physicians about to talk with their surgeons, is not only are you not stepping on their toes, you're not necessarily taking their patients. To begin with, we, we're only doing a couple hundred thousand spine surgeries when there's over 7 million lumbar spinal stenosis patients that are symptomatic. So this is not a matter of stepping on their toes to take patients. The other idea is, is, is the, the idea that you can now no longer have a virgin spine. What we, you know, what we see with the VertiFlex devices, there's no bony removal. Uh, you don't create scar tissue. This is actually placed in between the spinous processes. If you imagine the worst case scenario is it does not work over time. So as we know with the data, which uh, Dr. Esposito is gonna go through, we have an 80% chance, at least even up to five years, that this will prevent you from moving on to have a further spine surgery, which I think is astronomical for a minimally invasive procedure of this type. But even if the patients fall into that small category of 20%, uh, the question is now, have you burned any bridges? And the answer is no. The spine surgeon can still go in and have an absolute virgin spine for the patient, and these are easily removed, especially with, with open surgery. We also know that with open surgery, over time, laminectomy has a high reoperation rate. That's for a lot of different reasons. Recurrence of the stenosis, scar tissue formation, or even uh, spinal instability that comes on over time. So you're no longer burning the bridges of not having a virgin spine. The other thing is uh, pointing out is the low complication profile that comes with these patients with, the, put, with the, putting in this device. We know that now interventional pain physicians are, are very inept and very skilled at doing these type of procedures and have demonstrated not only in the study, but the press registry after uh, market release that the complication rate is extremely low and this is very safe for patients, especially being outside the canal and outside the, uh, any type of neural compromise. So the next slide, I'm gonna pass it on uh, to my colleague, Dr. Esposito, a uh, great colleague to work with and uh, has really uh, built up a great name for himself in the field and has worked a lot with VertiFlex and he's gonna present the, uh, the data for VertiFlex. Thanks, Stephen, for the kind introduction. And uh, I, I think you did a great job laying out and illustrating what the issue is uh, and how many patients in, in our country suffer from uh, this disease and uh, where Superion really fits in in the uh, treatment algorithm for spinal stenosis uh, with neurogenic claudication. So uh, I think you laid it out very nicely. And, you know, the the great thing about the Superion and VertiFlex procedure is that it uh, allows for a favorable uh, neural pathway dimension, right? So the neural pathway, the spinal canal, the lateral recesses, and the foramina are actually improved with the uh, VertiFlex procedure. And uh, Stephen actually did a, a very nice study and had uh, published this uh, review and cadaveric study uh, last year in pain medicine. And I certainly recommend all of you uh, to, to search that and, uh, and, and take a look. It was uh, really eye-opening. Um, and so if we move on to the next slide, uh, we're going to go over the, uh, the, the effect that VertiFlex has uh, on these different dimensions. Uh, but first, uh, I think it's important to uh, recapitulate our understanding about how Superion is meant to work. And uh, it's an indirect decompression, but really what we're trying to do is limit extension, right? These patients with spinal stenosis are the ones uh, that, you, that demonstrate the shopping cart sign, right? They're getting relief in flexion uh, or, when they're, uh, or when they're seated in flexion, right? And so what we're trying to do is, is limit the extension that these patients have that cause these symptoms. And uh, why is that? Well, if you look you know, in this middle column, what we see is that patients who uh, are in extension, that the area of the uh, central canal uh, actually decreases, right? And so this is 
um, a structural issue and this decreased area causes pressure on these nerves, which then causes the symptoms. Um, same thing with the foramina area and the ligamentum flavum, actually, the thickness increases in extension. Uh, whereas in flexion, you know, we see these biomechanical changes, right? Why do patients get relief of their symptoms in flexion? Well, it's because the area of the canal, the area of their uh, foramen are actually increasing. And believe it or not, the ligamentum flavum actually, thickness actually decreases in flexion. Think about kind of like a rubber band getting stretched out. And so in this, uh, in, in this study, uh, where uh, you know Stephen and his colleagues uh, looked at uh, the impact of superion in uh, the biomechanics of cadavers, what we saw was that with the superion in place, uh, and when we tried to extend those lumbar spines, the canal area actually maintained an increase in area as compared to uh, a, uh, a cadaver who was in extension without the uh, without the superion. So uh, we also saw this uh, in the foraminal area, and we also saw that the ligamentum flavum thickness also maintained a decrease in thickness. So uh, the vertiflex procedure in superion actually has these biomechanical favorable impact on the neural pathway. If we move on to the next slide, uh, what, we, what we see is that uh, from that cadaveric study, uh, that the superior doesn't just treat central spinal stenosis, but also takes into account the foraminal zones and the lateral recesses, although those may be a little bit harder to measure. Uh, and what do we see in, in practice, right? Uh, we, we rarely see patients who just have an isolated central stenosis or an isolated foraminal stenosis. Oftentimes, these patients who uh, are presenting with this failing back and with this uh, spinal stenosis, they have multifactorial stenosis. They have the central stenosis, they have lateral recess stenosis, they have foraminal stenosis. So uh, what we know is that these patients often are going to benefit from superion by having a, an impact on uh, affecting all of these zones of the, uh, of the spinal canal. And so what does this mean in, uh, in real life? Well, if we move on to the next slide, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, the, the data that's available. And so uh, many of you have probably reviewed this uh, before, but if we look at the uh, IDE study, uh, which I think uh, is, it was quite impactful, not just in uh, what it examined and what it compared and uh, uh, the results, but the fact that uh, the, the arm that looked at the vertiflex patients was carried out to five years. Very rarely do we have five years of data. Uh, but the study design uh, for this approval study uh, had almost 400 patients, and what they compared the Superion device to was uh, the existing XSTOP. And obviously, it was across multiple sites um, throughout the country. Uh, it was randomized, uh, it was uh, blinded, um, single blinded, and the uh, the outcomes that we looked at were uh, primarily the Zurich Claudication Questionnaire, the ZZQ. And, and I think uh, what's so impactful about this is that it really looks at functional measures, right? Uh, we, we hear this more and more these days that we're not just focused on the pain score, uh, because what does a pain score mean if the patient really isn't functioning better? Uh, and so this, I think, is uh, one of the strong points about this study is that it looked at uh, this ZZQ, which, uh, which looks at function. Uh, and so we, we followed this and secondary outcomes like the VAS and the ODI and the short form health survey and the, and the radiology. And we followed uh, these patients and we looked at them at two years, three, four, and five years. Uh, after, after two years, you know, the FDA approved the Superion for, for use in the general market. But again, the, the Vertiflex arm was followed out to five years. And so what did we see in this? If we go to the next slide, we'll talk about some of the, uh, the outcomes. And that is, is that over five years, uh, when we look at claudication symptoms, patients uh, demonstrated a 75% improvement 
in the uh, in the pain in their legs, uh, a, a two thirds improvement in the back pain that they experienced, and then looking at function. Um, they had 85% of patients were able to reduce their opioid burden. Again, as Stephen said, in this day and age of the opioid epidemic, uh, we're looking to have these, uh, these interventions and these treatment options that decrease the opioid burden for our patients. And then uh, very rarely do we see in, uh, in anything that we do uh, such a high satisfaction rating uh, by patients. And 90% of patients were satisfied with the relief and the improved function that, um, that they obtained uh, 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 over five years. So we certainly see this durability of improvement and uh, both in pain and function. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, this really leads to more questions, right? Uh, well, sure, you know, you say that this was in a controlled setting, right? Uh, well, what is, what is life really like? What is it out, what, is the, what are the results out there in, in the real world? Uh, and, and the fact is, is that uh, Vertiflex and Boston, they put together the press registry, which really looked at real world outcomes uh, in the hands of, uh, of, of pain physicians all over the country. And if we move to the next slide, what we see is that the results were recapitulated uh, from the IDE study and that uh, functional improvement was maintained, uh, VIS scores uh, were maintained, and patient satisfaction was maintained. So it makes me uh, feel very confident when I walk into a room and discuss the treatment options of spinal stenosis uh, to tell a patient hey, you know, there, there's an 80 to 90% chance that you're going to be satisfied with your results. You're going to have uh, a functional improvement and you're going to have improvement in your pain. Uh, so four out of five chance or nine out of 10 chance that you're going to have this improvement. And this was, uh, this data was published, uh, uh, 12 month data and the registry continues. So it'll be interesting to see how this uh, real world data draws out. So just to uh, summarize, Right, we have uh, an F FDA approval based on a level one RCT with five years of outcome data. Uh, it's one of the largest trials that we have uh, based uh, looking at uh, lumbar spinal stenosis treatment. Uh, it's been published in multiple journal articles. And, uh, you know, uh, true to the saying, you know, no money, no mission, uh, this is, has a category one code established for reimbursement purposes for the practice. Uh, so uh, with this compelling data, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Mehta, uh, to talk about how we identify patients that will benefit. Hey, thank you. Sorry, uh, my I was muted. But um, so um, my name is Pankaj Mehta. I'm going to be the talking about the tail end of this talk. Uh, one of the key things which Dr. Pulaski mentioned was, I think the really take home message from his talk was about the prevalence of lumbar spinal stenosis in our community, um, in our um, city, in our state, in our country, in the, and globally. And I think this is something we really need to be mindful of. What um, Mike said is, is so crucial that you have to look at evidence. And I think the evidence is very compelling about using a therapy like Superion, especially when you promise this to the patients and, and tell them that the real world scenario actually um, is mimics what the level of an evidence shows. And we've seen some of the uh, drawbacks of, of this philosophy of a real world scenario mimicking the level one evidence in certain therapies. And I think this is where Vortiflex stands uh, out, where um, you can really promise the patient. But then the question is, who is that patient in your practice? I've, I've been to so many practices, spoken to peers and colleagues, and within, even within my own practice for the first couple of months when I embraced this therapy, the question really to myself and my team was, who, who are those patients and what is the diagnostic algorithm for um, using a therapy for uh, symptomatic LSS? And, and just to kind of like sort of summarize in one quick slide before we move on is, if you have a radiographic evidence of lumbar spinal stenosis, uh, the next question really is, is that symptomatic? And if the answer is yes, then the next question should be, 
does this patient get relief in those symptoms um, when the patient sits down or any format of flexion, such as using a cane or a walker or sitting down or, or leaning on the countertop, um, resting between daily functions um, in their house or life? Um, and, and if the answer is yes to that, then you know that if you actually provide an extension blocking effect on that patient at that level, where the patient has radiographic evidence of stenosis, then um, this patient will benefit from this therapy. But, but before you proceed on to schedule this patient, um, you wanna quickly rule out the contraindications, right? You wanna make sure that you, um, the patient actually qualifies for this therapy and, and all the relative and absolute contraindications are being um, looked at. Um, then really the last question is that, how bad is the stenosis? It, does this patient qualify for a surgical exploration? Or is this something where our surgical colleagues will not operate, such as high-risk cases, or maybe it's a symptomatic mild to moderate disease? And all of these things form the algorithm in your practice. Next slide. So again, if you actually take this algorithm, which I just mentioned, and, and you basically put it in the form of a flow, you will find that it will become easy to identify LSS or symptomatic LSS in a practice. And um, like, again, this slide is, is not uh, the, the algorithm, but it is suggestive of a skeleton algorithm, which you can adopt in your practice and, and look at your patients day to day who come in with back and leg pain. And why do we need to have an algorithm? Because one of the things I realized in my practice is nobody walks in your practice with these stamped diagnosis of spinal stem stenosis. Patients walk in with symptomatic uh, diagnosis, which means that patients will walk in with back pain and leg pain. And one of the things we do as physicians, as pain physicians, is triage the pain generators and then come up with a working diagnosis. And I think that's really where LSS actually gets embedded between those, uh, those um, confusing symptoms which patients walk in with back and leg pain. So the onus is on us to dissect the pain generators down and move on this algorithm which you just see and then ask these questions yourself. Has this patient failed conservative care? Like most patients would come in my practice who have probably had physical therapy, have had short-term relief, um, had patients probably had some interventions in, in my own practice with my own partners, or maybe coming from a competing practice or the next door practice. Ask yourself, this patient has severe stenosis, patient is symptomatic. Why is this patient not a surgical um, candidate? Is this patient got high surgical risk? Is this patient got some comorbidities which could uh, prohibit this patient from undergoing um, extensive surgery or an extensive fusion? And, and then the question is, if this patient has already had a structural surgery and a fusion and has had a direct decompression at a level, because of the fact that the patient has an immobilized segment in the distal part of the spine, the adjacent segment is that crumbling. Is that leading to or giving birth to a new segment of spinal stenosis, which could be symptomatic and be responsible for the patient's symptoms? And if the answer is yes, then you need to have an algorithm for that. So it all comes down to what's that core classification or core algorithm which you need to keep in mind as you're busy in your practice with your nurse practitioners, with your colleagues, and seeing follow-ups for 15 minutes, and then we all take pride in how busy we are and how loaded our schedule is, but I think it is important to have a cheat sheet, right? So you wanna make sure you focus on the patients who have failed conservative care, who have not got relief from other interventions, who may be high surgical risk, and patients especially who have had failed back surgery syndrome. Why do we focus on patients with structural surgery or failed back surgery syndrome? Because we are all high quality interventionalists and we do a lot of spinal cord stimulators. We have a lot of neuromodulation therapies in our practice. And guess what is the number one indication of um, um, spinal cord stimulators in our practice. It's failed back surgery syndrome. So when a patient walks in with structural surgery or um, Im structural immobilization of the spine because of a fusion, we need to start thinking about why is this patient still symptomatic? And what else is going on right above the level of the fusion? And again, it goes back to then looking at the study, looking at the, the robust data, which Mike mentioned about how good the back pain improved, 75% improvement in the leg. But more than that, while we are all working as part of society, as part of um, in the community, as colleagues and peers, we all talk about how can we curb the opioid abuse or the opioid overuse in our community. And all of this is, is one step forward 
which will help us reduce the consumption of opioids, especially in these patients with LSS, who technically contributed to a roadblock in our practice, and, and the data shows that. Um, again, other interventions, right? So um, Tim, myself, and, and a few of us uh, presented this at NANS, uh, I think it was a couple of years back or two years back, where we showed that what is, a, what is that um, number one frustration which most neuromodulators have or see in their practice, that there are a lot of therapies which do great, um, and no matter what company it is, but that a time comes when a spinal cord stimulator ceases to function to the expectations of the patient. It doesn't mean that the therapy has failed. It doesn't mean that the company has failed. What it means is that we still don't have a robust algorithm as to how do we then work this patient up from testing microfractures to lead migrations to tolerance to are there any other parallel pain generators? And one of the things we saw in our practice and, and Tim saw in his practice was that a lot of these patients who we basically labeled as uh, having inefficacious spinal cord stimulator therapies uh, were in a sense, were not feeling the benefit of the therapy because of uh, adjacent or a parallel pain generator. And so what we did is we treated their claudication and leg pain by indirect uh, decompression or putting an interspinal spacer device. And lo and behold, these patients got better instantaneously in their back pain and their leg pain. And clearly whatever residual opioids they were on, uh, despite stimulation, uh, neuromodulation, um, we were able to get rid of that. Again, the same thing with high risk, high surgical risk. Um, Dr. Naidu and myself presented this at INS uh, last year in Australia, where we showed that there were a lot of patients above the age of 85 and 90 who, because of their age or other comorbidities, were not able to undergo surgery. And despite the fact that they had symptomatic late moderate, maybe early severe stenosis, in consultation with our surgical colleagues, we went ahead and treated their symptoms with a spacer. And you can see clearly here the improvement in back and leg pain. Next slide. And, and again, like I talked about, right, one of the key things we need to really focus on is uh, what is going on when you immobilize the uh, spine. And, and a lot of things happen. The force of the vector, which is the natural force of the vector, changes direction and dissipates away from the spine uh, or, or gets um, slowed down when it leads to fusion. And so without going too much into physics, what we did is, is we started treating adjacent segment symptomatic lumbar spinal stenosis and, and put it spaces as long as there was a viable spinous process. And what we saw is that people who had a adjacent segment disease with or without stimulators did way better than if we had left this untreated or um, you know, patients were afraid of having surgery. Sometimes the surgeons didn't want to extend the fusion and a lot of these patients uh, did well. You can see an almost 80% improvement in leg pain. Next slide. And again, it all comes down to you see a robust data uh, why, because of which, why we should choose this therapy. The fact that it actually works on lateral recess and foraminal stenosis, it is very important to understand the prevalence of LSS in your community and your practice, like Stephen said. And again, if you're wondering, where are these patients? I don't have spinal stenosis in my practice, or why is my stimulator not working? Or why am I, why am I frustrated? Um, despite the fact that a, a efficacious therapy of spinal cord stimulation is going on in people who have had back surgery before, failed back surgery syndrome, you, you need to start thinking about a parallel pain generator such as symptomatic spinal stenosis. But here are the advantages, like Stephen said. There is no resection of tissues. So when you talk to your surgeons, um, they're not worried about you violating the integrity of the spinal column. Um, the fact that you can actually help the, these patients with central stenosis, lateral recess stenosis, and foraminal stenosis in a ripple effect at that level, uh, I think speaks volumes for this therapy. And, and like uh, Mike had mentioned, that this is not a 5 on 10 approval. This is a, it's a, it's a FDA approval based on a level one RCD. And while we are all focusing on an evidence-based embracement of new therapies, I think it's very important for young neuromodulators, young implanters to understand this concept. Next slide. So based on all of these things, one of the things I want to quickly mention is about Boston Scientific. When Boston Scientific wide Vertiflex, really the first thing which was offered to interventional pain physicians was um, a, a combination of a portfolio therapy. And, and the portfolio therapies encompass spinal cord stimulation, radiofrequency ablation, and Vertiflex now. But what was the whole reason or why should one start looking at a portfolio 
a bracket of therapies. It's because if you look at this Venn diagram, that's the patient we see in and out. That's your 65, 70, 75 year old gentleman who's coming in your practice, who has mostly three broad groups of pain generators. They have uh, a bad disc leading to radiculopathy and maybe neuritis or radiating neuritis or painful neuritis. They have some axial back pain because of facets. And we always knew that and we always treated those with spinal cord stimulation and radio frequency ablation alternating one with the other or with epidural steroid injections. But we really never had a robust therapy for the third when part of the Venn diagram, which was symptomatic LSS or neurogenic lidication. And, and, and fortunately, there's one company now which offers all of these three. And so based on medical necessity, I think most physicians now have the luxury to um, choose or focus on each pain generator having its own implantable therapy. Next slide. And, and, and that's it for Vortiflex. Uh, thanks, Tim. Well, thanks, Pan College. I think we're going to start with just a few questions. Uh, I think Dawood has a question for Stephen first. Dawood? Yeah, Dr. Falowski, I think this might be very similar to the question I asked you uh, when we were talking about minimally invasive SI fusion. But it's more of a political um, question because, again, you know, we're going to have, you know, hundreds of people, if not thousands, that are going to watch this, interventional pain doctors that will want to incorporate this procedure into their practice. And there may be some political opposition from their surgical colleagues, either within their own institution or their own practice. What is your advice for someone like myself or Pankaj or Michael uh, when they're trying to approach their surger, surgical colleagues when they, they want to incorporate this? It's a great question, Dawood, and I think it really, it really fits into the state of uh, pain care right now, and that is that interventional pain physicians are starting to do more and more. We're starting to realize that their skill set is capable of that. The field has pushed towards minimally invasive procedures. You know, I'm somebody who's dual trained in complex spine, uh, lumbar fusions, thoracic lumbar fusions, but I'm also trained in procedures like neuromodulation, spinal cord stim, vertiflex. So I tend to see it from both sides. And I think it's, it's important for surgeons to realize that this change is coming. Uh, the skill set of interventional pain physicians is, is there, and they're going to start doing these minimally invasive procedures. Now, on the flip side, I think to my uh, fellow colleagues here, too, with interventional pain, the discussion with the surgeon is a matter of educating the surgeon. Unfortunately, most surgeons uh, view these type of procedures as something like x which was an open surgical procedure with a two-piece implant. And that's what they think interventional pain physician is doing now. But that's not the case, as we went over today. So I think that the, the key is educating the spine surgeon and educating them on three aspects. One is that it's not that you're going to have complications that you can't deal with and you're going to have to call in the surgeon. Two is uh, you're, they're still going to have a virgin spine. So in the worst case scenario is your minimally invasive, low risk profile procedure doesn't work. And that's the worst case scenario. And they still have a virgin spine to go to. And then finally, the last thing is, is that you're not stepping on their toes. You're not taking your patients. It's the patients earlier in the algorithm or later in the algorithm. Both of those they're not operating on. Great answer. Even those are great points. Thank you for that. I think uh, we want to do what's less invasive and more cost effective, but also efficacious. And that leads my, we have two last quick questions for Pankaj and Michael. Michael, the question for you is this, you know, I've always been told, you know, we've been doing Vertiflex since the study. We were part of the study. I think we we're the only non-surgeons in the study. But, you know, let's say you have a level at three, four, that is the worst level, but they're also bad at four or five. So I've been told by some, do the lower level first, and I've been told by others, do the worst level first. How do you make a decision which level to do first in a two-level uh, Vertiflex implant? Flip a coin. No, I'm kidding. Uh, the way that I do it is uh, I'll actually take some scout images, and I will look to see uh, which uh, inner spinous space is narrower, and then on the lateral also to look and see which uh, part of the spinal laminar line is more ventral. And that's the level that I'm going to do first, because I want that uh, spacer, that superion that needs to sit as far uh, ventral as possible to be put in first. Uh, so I, I'm going to do that level first and then I'm going to go and do the, the next level. Usually 
uh, the the more superior level and and or the uh, the most severely stenotic level is the one that I'm going to choose to do first. No, I think that's great insight, Michael. I think that lateral view is so important. Pankaj, last question of the session. Uh, it goes back to a point you made about a study you and I did together, but it's important. Let's say a new patient comes to see you with stenosis, fell conservative care, has moderate stenosis at a couple of levels, definitely a candidate for an interspinous spacer, but they also have a previous uh, back surgery at 5-1 with radicular leg pain in the left leg. Which do you do first, a stimulator trial or an interspinous spacer, knowing that they may need both? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it's something we really all see in our practice. And to start off, with one line answer is they may need both because we are treating two separate pain generators. Uh, and my, my algorithm in this case, Tim, is that um, I discussed with the patient that there are two separate entities, two separate pain generators, which may need its own implantable therapies. And, and what I do is I uh, will do a body flex first. And the reason I do that is because I pay my IPGs a little higher up. And so, um, you know, if you don't do the body flex first and you do the stimulator first, then and, and you end up doing body flex, the entire action is under lateral fluoroscopy. And sometimes it's, it's pain in the rear by, you know, somebody has to push the IPG away, especially if you're targeting lower levels, three, four, four, five. So just, it's just been my sort of practice philosophy to do body flex first. Um, kind of indirectly decompress it, um, and then uh, you know I'll do a stimulator trial and an implant, uh, space it out over a few weeks. No, I think that's really great advice, uh, gentlemen. Thank you so much. This was a wonderful session. We greatly appreciate all three of you, and look forward to seeing you in person, Thanks. hopefully sometime soon. Thanks, uh, guys. Dawood, do you want to introduce the next session? Yeah, so we're going to pivot just a bit, still focusing on the same disease entity, spinal stenosis, but an alternative way to address it. So we're going to have uh, our team, um, the key opinion leaders from the Vertos team, talk to us about redefining the mild procedure, emerging techniques, and advancing the treatment algorithm. Uh, we'll have Dr. Pope, if he can make it, I think he might be running a little bit late, Dr. Escobar, Dr. Patterson, and Dr. Wiseman. Uh, Dr. Escobar, can you please kick off for us? You're on mute, Alex. Good morning, everyone. Excited to be here with you all. I do believe Dr. Pope uh, cannot make it, so you get the uh, blessing of uh, having me do his section. Excited to be to talk about redefined surgical technique and treatment algorithms uh, for using minimally invasive lumbar decompression in your practice. When you identify patients with lumbar spinal stenosis, as we've all addressed here, um, we want to really look for the uh, root cause and whether or not there is ligament and clavin hypertrophy. Hypertrophy. We have a very effective technique to address uh, the cause of the problem without leaving anything behind. Okay. The right patient. And so, uh, what I commonly hear um, uh, in practice uh, when I'm training physicians and discussing uh, this treatment option is that even physicians who have had success with the technique in the past have sort of abandoned the therapy due to some misconceptions. We want to clarify that. Um, because I, since fellowship uh, at the Cleveland Clinic, have witnessed this therapy be extremely effective and safe for patients with ligament inflavum hypertrophy and symptoms of neurogenic claudication. Next slide. So we really want to focus today's session on the uh, emerging um, surgical techniques, as well as the algorithm in place for the use of minimally invasive lumbar decompression. It is well established that the mild procedure has scientific evidence and a large body of experience. The Midas Encore RCT has demonstrated statistically superiority of common treatments we use for lumbar spinal stenosis, albeit some may not believe epidural steroids are the treatment of choice for neurogenic claudication. It is common practice in all pain specialties to use epidural steroid injections in the face of stenosis, whether it's to treat the radicular symptoms uh, or uh, symptoms related to um, the, the pathology of neurogenic claudication. So therefore, what do we find when patients uh, continue to seek or continue to use the similar uh, techniques of efficacy is that these patients seek alternative care and they'll go to another specialist or another practice uh, if they aren't able to effectively address their symptomatology. I think the most important part of this is to identify the safety profile of the mild procedure in that 
many of our patients have undergone epidural steroid injections. And we've seen with valid evidence that the safety of the mild procedure is no different to that of an epidural steroid injection. And the, the most common thing or concern would be an inadvertent dural puncture, which when performed safety, safely and effectively uh, is not a concern of ours. Therefore, you can confidently tell your patients that the risk they assume with this technique is no different to that of an epidural steroid. Next slide. So as mentioned earlier, um, and I think it's critically important in our specialty that we measure and track outcomes data. And seeing that data beyond one year is rare. Uh, I applaud all companies and um, all physicians to continue to move the specialty forward uh, by tracking these outcomes. And we want to advance this technique by really exposing you tonight to the single uh, access uh, technique, which has been developed by many KOLs within our space, uh, to optimize time, to reduce fluoroscopy uh, exposure or ionizing radiation, and offer a more convenient and streamlined approach to both physicians and patients. We know that the mild portal is less than 5.1 millimeters, therefore we're able to successfully treat bilateral um, spinal stenosis with a single entry, single access point, leaving less time uh, to have to create those uh, extra incisions and an improved patient experience. I can tell you from experience that all of my patients who have undergone a minimally invasive lumbar decompression experience minimal to no post-procedural pain. In fact, I commonly employ a routine uh, epidurogram at the end of the case and ensure adequate epidural spread and then use epidural steroids uh, to help minimize any post-inflammatory response, which uh, helps in that. So we encourage our patients to stay active. We want them to move to improve. And in that, we don't just look at this as a uh, definitive treatment that requires no other uh, factors. Therefore, physical therapy and core strengthening um, are all things that we employ uh, post-procedure, which our patients can uh, do quickly. Next slide. So one of the things that uh, Vertos Medical has done exceptionally well is really listen to practicing clinicians. One of uh, the many features that we see with innovation comes around uh, optimizing techniques and not recreating something new. And what we've found uh, through many hours spent in the cadaver lab, as well as um, employing this streamlined technique in many of our practices, is that we can commonly access both sides uh, of the lamina using the single entry point that we will see in a video shortly. Uh, this allows, again, for minimal procedural pain, for improved uh, time and efficiency, and as well as um, the lack of the uh, need for uh, prolonged uh, ionizing radiation exposure. So at, uh, at one of these uh, training sites, um, we, thanks to Dr. Chapin, um, have really um, explored and uh, refined the technique of the single access or single incision um, te uh, technique. By Utilizing the single access point, um, we are using the cannula to really direct to each side. And we'll show you here in this, in this video to come, uh, next slide, what that looks like. So how you wanna utilize this is identifying the treatment level, the targeted treatment level. Typically, oh, we could start play. Typically starting about one to one and a half vertebral bodies below. We utilize a spinal needle finder to identify the trajectory and access. And after making that single axis entry, we use a lot of uh, torque and drag uh, on the cannula to identify and to uh, treat uh, the ipsilateral side that you'll be uh, addressing. I recommend that while you're doing this, you are changing views, so going from AP as we see here, to ensure that you're not crossing the midline and that you're accessing the inner laminar space at an appropriate angle. Almost all of our patients now being treated with mild uh, are being employed this single access uh, entry site, uh, which has created a vast reduction in radiation exposure as well as time and efficiency. I think another thing that can't be overstated is the fact that we can optimize and use this procedure uh, without the need of a sales rep or force 
um, and treat multiple levels simultaneously while still keeping ionizing exposure at a minimum. Typically in my practice, I see uh, about one and a half uh, minutes or less uh, of uh, fluoroscopy time, as well as less than 50 milligrays of exposure. Uh, therefore, we hope that you can uh, come to find that this uh, single access uh, ac a single access entry um, should reshape how you utilize this procedure and also encourage you to op optimize and offer patients with evidence of ligaments and platelet hypertrophy the minimally invasive lumbar decompression. We can field questions or hey Alex. Hey. So tell me about your outcomes with you know you've been, you've incorporated this streamlining technique now, uh, I believe over the last few months since our uh, kind of redefining this procedure several months back in New York. How have your outcomes been? So in my practice, using this approach, um, I think as far as the efficiency of the uh, procedure itself, phenomenal. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the radiation exposure as well as um, the uh, milligrays that you know, we're, we're using are minimal. Um, uh, the patient outcomes from day one have been successful. Um, and I've seen about Similar to that of other techniques, about an 80 to 90 percent satisfaction rate, which is critical. Looking at this as a functional restoration, um, we are tracking um, the amount of time these patients are standing and walking, and uh, we've seen that about 70 to 75 percent of patients are seeing at least a doubling, if not tripling, of that time, um, as well as a reduction of the ODI of at least 10 points. Um, so we're continuing to track it, um, but I find that. Patients are, patients are recognizing this as an effective treatment and telling many uh, members of the community. Alex, before we get to Dr. Weissman, I have just one more quick question for you. So, you know, you were in West Virginia. Uh, I still have a great picture of the two of us together here. And we talked about the single incision technique, and I've really gone to that. And our radiation time has been cut in half. But those fellows and residents who've never seen this procedure before, that's a big difference because we used to make a two, maybe four incisions if you did two levels bilaterally. My question for you is this, have you changed the way you do the epidurogram? Because I know I have, but I want to see how you're doing your epidurogram now for that procedure, and then we'll go into Dr. Weissman. So traditionally, when I was in fellowship, we would do an epidurogram at each level, at each ipsilateral side. Um, I find I found that to be too cumbersome, and with the use of our safety landmarks of the spinal laminar junction and the contralateral oblique view, um, I employ a single epidurogram and try to get it at the apex and as close to midline as possible. Um, and the only time I'll, I'll reserve uh, you know, accessing a different entry point is if I lose that epidurogram uh, because I will be utilizing an epidural steroid injection at the end of the case. So I, I, I use a single epidurogram for uh, every case. No, I think that's very helpful. Awesome. We appreciate you very much. I'll we'll maybe have you back at the end, but uh, I think now we go into Dr. Dr. Jackie Weisbaum. Jackie? Good job, Alex. Hi, guys. Thank you so much. Um, Alex, uh, did a really great job explaining everything about the new procedure um, algorithm, which has been really amazing. I think um, I also have the benefit of following uh, my colleagues, Stephen and Michael, who spent a lot of time talking about uh, neurogenic clot occasion. So we know um, when these patients are presenting to the office that they're coming in complaining of um, that weakness and low back pain radiating into the lower extremities that when they're up and walking and they really can't walk for any period of time unless they are bending forward or sitting down. And the key thing is that these patients do get relief when they bend forward or sit down because if they're not getting relief when that with those kind of activities or changes in activities, they might not be someone who's really truly exhibiting signs and symptoms consistent with neurogenic claudication. One of the most beautiful things about being able to look at your own imaging is specifically for these patients, when we're considering mild, we want to see that there's hypertrophy of the ligamentum flavum beyond 2.5 millimeters. Anything beyond that means that patient is a candidate for this treatment. And so moving forward, it's important that you understand that even though patients may also have foraminal stenosis, if they have central stenosis that is indicated by this hypertrophic ligamentum flavum, then they are a candidate for mild. Additionally, you want to make sure that there's less than a grade two spondylolisthesis so that you don't have to worry about any kind of spinal instability. Next slide, please. 
So again, things that we want to think about, um, most of us, like Alex was talking about, when patients come to our office, they're typically patients who are having neurogenic claudication. And the first thing that we offer them is an epidural steroid injection. Uh, when I see this for my patients and they come in, I'll talk to them about mild. I'll give them the booklet or the brochure about mild at the same time while I'm actually scheduling them for an epidural. But I tell them that the epidural is not necessarily 100% predictive if they're going to actually get relief from the procedure. So ideally, I'm trying to buy them a little bit of relief, but I tell them again that even if it's not long lasting or it's not as efficacious as we'd like it to be, it doesn't mean that they aren't going to have a successful outcome with mild because we look at, again, that hypertrophic ligament to see if that's really what the major compression is coming from. Now, in these patients, we also have things where they see hypertrophic facets or a disc bulge complex in addition to that hypertrophic ligamentum flavin, but being able to reduce a significant amount of that tissue in the posterior aspect allows there to be some more room for those nerves, those nerves rather. So as they're walking, they don't have that compression um, on, from the pressure of everything while they're standing up. Next slide. So again, um, thinking about where these things fall into place. So when patients come in again, I'm giving them that mild booklet as I'm thinking about scheduling or actually scheduling them for an injection. Um, I work with a spine surgeon. And so, you know, to the comments earlier about wondering if this is something that our partners or our colleagues might find difficult uh, as a part of the algorithm, I think of this for many of my patients who, A, don't want a large surgery or aren't looking to be um, in the hospital overnight. Um, it's very easy for them to do this as an outpatient under minimal sedation. Also, if these patients have any degree of osteoporosis, I don't worry about um, damage to their bones when I'm performing mild. Um, and having trained when I first left fellowship and now seeing this new streamlined technique that's been evolving, I, I find it to be something that really is simple for the patients to tolerate and give them the great results that they're looking for without the large invasive surgery that my partner might have to do for them. Next slide, please. With that, I think I pass it after this to um, Dennis, who's gonna talk a little bit more about the data but what we want to see is that the most important thing for us to talk about is that this is exactly a procedure that is safe and efficacious, and it has a similar profile of safety to epidural steroid injections. And we can see that the amount of adverse effects regarding procedures or device-related uh, adverse events is approximately 1.3 in both epidurals and in mild. Um, and there's really been zero reported adverse events. Again, we don't have any issues with seeing any spinal instability developing when we take out small pieces of the ligamentum flavum with this procedure. And additionally, we've had zero issues with any spine fractures over the past few years um, when we're decompressing that ligamentum flavum. So both really important things, particularly for our patients who are elderly and have, like I said, osteoporosis. So next slide, I think, is Dennis on more of the data. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. How are you guys doing? Um, so I've got a single study or a single center study uh, by Dr. Perez uh, Bolkowski from Levis Pain Management, New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And basically, what I like about this study is that it highlights um, how the data that uh, Dr. Escobar went over and the, 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 the Midas Encore study, how this translate into the real world. So you know, a lot of times we do studies, um, the criteria on selecting patients is so strict that, you know, you get a good outcome there, but when it translates to the real world, sometimes you don't get as good as an outcome. So it's nice to take a look at your own patients, retrospectively see if you're getting the same results that you see in the, the studies that were done um, um, uh, formerly. And so we've got a single center here, and what we have is 47 patients, and we see it's predominantly female, 66 compared to 34% for males. What I like about the study is that it also tracked spinal cord morbidities. So I think, you know, with the mild procedure in the past, we were all looking for unicorns. Patients who had central canal stenosis only due to ligamentum flavum hypertrophy with no other uh, sources uh, contributing to the stenosis. But what we see here is that we, and, and what we've learned from the Midas Encore study is that there's multi-factorial um, uh, stenosis in these patients and there are multiple comorbidities resulting in the stenosis. So it could be, um, um, in, in this study, we saw that all patients had ligamentum flavum hypertrophy to be a candidate for the study. But on top of that, majority of them had bulging discs, facet arthropathy or hypertrophy. 
They have foraminal narrowing and lateral recess stenosis as well. And when you look at the levels treated, you see predominantly the levels treated were L3-4 and L4-5. And I think if we all look at our own clinical uh, practice, we'll see that majority of the levels that we're offering patients either some type of spinal stenosis intervention where we're, uh, majority of the time we're targeting those levels. So this seems to be pretty accurate with uh, what we see in our own clinics. Um, and what's interesting enough is that when you take these patients and you um, look at results based off of, did this patient get an epidural before moving forward with the, the mild or just one epidural before moving with mild versus multiple, what we see is there's no difference in um, outcomes. So if you look at patients who got one or no um, uh, epidurals, we see that there is a significant drop in the VAS three months after having the procedure. And then we see that patients who got multiple epidurals before being offered the procedure, we see the same outcome. And so what I think this leads to as a conclusion is should we consider uh, moving mild up in the algorithm, meaning that should we offer them the procedure, knowing that they have neurogenic claudication as a source of their symptoms without doing an epidural steroid injection first. And I think that's what a lot of us should consider in our practice. Um, to me, you know, I think of several reasons uh, to do it, uh, or, or the, the only reasons to consider an epidural is one, confidence. You know, if this is the first time you've seen a patient, you've never done a procedure on them before, you may want to build confidence with them by doing one epidural to give them short-term relief. Two, some of these patients are going to come to your clinic. They're going to clinically have neurogenic claudication. You're going to have access to an imaging report. But unfortunately, you know, several several times I've seen the radiologist doesn't mention ligament and platelet hypertrophy. And I, I physically got to track down the films myself. I got to measure to make sure that they got greater than 2.5 millimeters of ligament and platelet hypertrophy before being able to offer them the procedure. So I may want to do an epidural steroid injection just to buy me time. Three. Um, patient preference. Maybe this patient is not interested in um, um, uh, moving forward with a mild procedure or something that, that they would see as more invasive and they're wanting to try an epidural. So that would be another scenario to do it. But if those three factors aren't a factor, um, what I see is a lot of these patients have seen multiple physicians. They've had multiple epidurals over the years. And the reason why they change providers is because they weren't getting long-term satisfactory relief. And so in this case, why would you want to make the same mistake that their other providers did in just offering them epidural and not offering them a higher level procedure like the mild procedure, which has shown to be just as safe as moving forward with an epidural out of the gate. Next slide. The, the last scenario, um, Oh, and this, this kind of goes over what we're saying is that in those scenarios, I think moving forward with, you know, these patients, they've got clinical neurogenic claudication. You've got imaging shows they got ligamentum hypertrophy. You know, mild is less invasive than putting hardware on their spine um, with an inner spinous spacer um, or doing a lumbar decompression. Why not consider doing a mild without doing an epidural from the initial consultation? Then, as I was saying, the, the, the second, if there is a reason um, that uh, to consider an epidural, one, it'd be for short-term pain relief while uh, I build confidence with the patient, track down imaging, or three, next slide, look at um, doing a CLO view when I do my epidural for uh, diagnostic and or pre-surgical planning to move forward with the mild procedure next on the patient. I think a lot of times while we're trying to track down the imaging, we can do this epidural and we can see the thinning of the epidural space at the level of interest and see that there's ligamentum, you know, uh, flavum hypertrophy buckling into the epidural space. And that also gives us more information on how to pre-plan for doing the mild procedure down the line. Next slide. And I think that's it. I think uh, invite uh, Dr. Escobar and Dr. Weismine back on for any last second questions. Yeah, Dennis, let me ask you a question. I, I've, I've, you know, I've done the mild procedure now for almost a decade and, and found it to be a great procedure and it's really gotten better. My question for you is really 
I think a complicated one. So let's say you have L3-4 ligament inflated hypertrophy, and you want to do a bilateral mount at that level, and you're worried about it being pretty stenotic. Um, do you do your epidural at the same level, or do you go a level above because of the stenosis at the level of treatment? Yeah, you know, what I have noticed is that, uh, just like Dr. Escobar was saying earlier, that a lot of times doing the epidural at the level of interest can, can just get in the way of using your instrumentation. And so I believe that going at the top of the, or the apex. So I will go a level above, do the epidural um, at that level, try to get an epidurogram. And, you know, I've done so many of these now that I can see that interlaminar line pretty clearly, even with if the contrast doesn't spread down. So I can kind of draw that line down in my mind or even on the screen and use that as my, as my landmarks for doing the procedure. And, you know, as we know, we can also refresh the epidurogram as we do the procedure. And what we should see is that it should start to spread down, you know, from above down into the level that we're working on as we decompress. And so I think that's a way to get the epidurogram out of the way um, so the needle isn't going to cause a problem and, and to allow us to see how well we've decompressed the level um, by refreshing the epidurogram as we go. Great, Great. answer. Thank you. Dolly? Uh, I have a question for Dr. Escobar. I think he did a really good job presenting the data and the streamlined technique. One criticism of the mild procedure I've heard from my colleagues is it's a procedure without a defined endpoint. What is your endpoint? When do you know to stop? You know, when I first started this procedure, I would just do it until I looked at the clock and my arm was tired and it had been an hour and I said, the procedure's over. What do you do to end this procedure? When do you know you're done? Excellent question and something that is always brought up. Um, I like to look at each step uh, as an endpoint in itself, um, starting with the epidurogram. Uh, we should have uh, define an epidurogram prior to coming to the case. Therefore, it should take no longer than four to five minutes to quickly get your epidurogram, and, and that's generous. Um, the next step in the, in the process is a single access entry point where we use the cannula, and that cannula needs to be docked at that uh, laminar, interlaminar junction that's somewhat parallel to, to allow the rangier to get up and over that uh, superior ridge. Um, we have identified that three to four um, grass or bites with the rangier at each level, both inferior and superiorly um, on each side, is typically sufficient enough as long as you're capturing uh, enough tissue with that bite. So if you pull out your rangier and all you see is a lot of yellow uh, fat, um, that's not an adequate bite. I wouldn't consider that one. So that's another endpoint, looking at three to four bites per lamina, inferiorly and superiorly. Uh, then the sculptor itself should be passed no more than two times using each pass with three to four bites. So every time you use the rangier, it's a single grasp and then clean the instrument. With the tissue sculptor, you pass that no more than twice. And with each pass, two to three grasps or bites of that ligament. A small change in uh, volume is a large change in pressure. Um, at the end, the, the final epidurogram in the lateral view is to uh, safely administer my local anesthetic and a small amount of dexamethasone. So each of those steps are their own endpoint, and those done sequentially uh, allow for an efficient uh, procedure. Okay, yeah, I really, great answer. I really like that. That that's really helped helped me that, to know that that's kind of a, a typical scenario. Um, and when you go well above that or below that, you're not kind of within the norm. That 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 does really help. I think guide us. No, I think the fact that uh, Dalwick's gets, arm gets tired shows us he needs to go to Orange Theory or something. Yeah. But uh, you know, that's another issue. <laughs> so, so, Dr. Weisman, uh, the question for you is this: though, and this happens pretty frequently. You have a patient that have multi-level disease. So, you know, you have an MRI, and you look at the you look at the MRI yourself, and you see a thick ligament at L3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 1. You know, and obviously you want to you want to make this as minimally invasive as possible, but you also want to make sure you do adequate treatment. How do you decide how many levels? And do you always do bilateral or can you do unilateral and someone has one-sided symptoms? I mean, I think those are really great questions, Tim. Um, I think, to be honest, again, going back to looking at the image and basically evaluating yourself, um, the degree of hypertrophic ligament at each level. So, I mean, most people are going to have some area that's going to be more significantly um, impacted than the others. I tend to try and only do like two levels at a time. And I think the reality is regarding doing it unilateral, bilateral, the new streamlined technique allows bilateral 
treatment to be done in a real simple and sequential matter per Alex's description. I mean, it's, it's kind of one of those things that has enabled me to get in and treat these patients. Um, for me, lately, the biggest patient that I found the most benefit from are patients who have had previous laminectomies or previous surgeries at levels below and then have developed stenosis above. And so having to treat those levels, sometimes you're, you're only going unilateral because, you know, you don't have a lamina to fall down on to rest your, um, your device on. So, I mean, it's just being careful and being cautious, but also, you know, looking and evaluating at what levels you find the most uh, hypertrophic ligament. And I think those are usually the ones that are best treated. Oh, good. A great answer. Dalwood? Yeah, Dennis, you um, presented some interesting da data from Dr. Priz's clinic about patients that had multiple ESIs and went on to mild, did really no better than the patient that just had one or no and went straight to mild. One thing I've heard and I've seen it kind of anecdotally myself is that sometimes patients will get the mild procedure and then over some time their pain may recur. Instead of repeating mild, you may consider doing an epidural. And I've heard patients say, hey, these epidurals seem to be a little bit more effective than they were pre-mild. Do you think there's anything to that or is that just hocus pocus? No, I, I think there's something to it. I mean, I, I've, but, you know, I, I did mild before um, uh, kind of had to go back into hiding and, and, and you know get behind the research before it could you know be, come back out within the last couple of years. And I have to say that I, I would do it on patients previously. They would do extremely well uh, for a period of time, and then they, maybe they'd get some some recurring symptoms. And at that point, I would look to try to do a simple epidural just to keep them out of going back to the OR and, and doing the mild procedure. And I would see that those patients would do pretty well. Um, following those epidurals where they seem to last longer. So before the mild procedure, if they'd only last, you know, a couple months, maybe at this point, it may last six months to a year. Um, and I've actually, you know, had a couple patients that during that hiatus would beg to, get, you know, have the mild procedure done again. And I have to say that since it's reemergence, I've taken two of those back and I've retreated levels that I previously treated six, seven years ago. And once again, the procedure worked very well and it's done well for those patients. And so far, those patients haven't asked to have an epidural repeated because um, they're still getting relief of their lower extremity pain. Yeah, Dennis, that's can, a, I, can I add one thing to that, Dr. Deer? Sure, sure, Alex, I'd love that. I just, I mean, you know, Dr. Patterson is extremely uh, proficient and has done this, you know, effectively to numerous patients. I think when we look at treatment algorithms, we want to really establish when is the right time for patients. So in my practice, if a patient comes back with recurrent symptoms, I'm not going to be eager to treat those patients. However, within three to six months, if they have not responded or feel like the symptoms, the symptoms have returned, that's where an interspinous spacer like Vertiflex would come into play for that patient. So I don't offer that to patients to tell them we're going to do this and then proceed with a spacer. I identify patients with ligaments and flavum hypertrophy, and in my practice, more than four millimeters. And if they fail to respond after three to six months or have recurrence of symptoms, I feel like that's where the, the interspinous spacer with Vertiflex fits a perfect uh, fit. So, you know, that's where I would employ these, and I encourage everyone to consider, you know, utilizing the strategies that we have uh, with, for the right patient. No, I like what you said, Alex. You know, I think that that's a debate, right? You know, I, someone, I think Jackie said 2.5 millimeters, you said four. I think the big key is it's the ligament compressing the spine. You know, if it's a big ligament, but it's not compressing, then then this procedure won't help the patient. If it's not that big, but it's compressing, it certainly may. So I think you just have to determine your own practice what's right. The last question I have for you guys, and uh, Alex, you started the process, so I'm going to have you go last because you just started the process of what I'm going to ask you. I'll start with Jackie, then the dentist, and the Alex. Give us a pearl. For those out there who are fellows or residents, a lot of people are going to listen to this on the recorded version of this, so we'll have, you know, many, many fellows and residents. Give me a pearl of this procedure in just a few sentences that's important. Jackie, start with you. Um, take time to look at your table and make sure that you understand how to get a good contralateral oblique. Not everybody does contralateral obliques in their training, and so it's a key part of this to understand what that image looks like. Um, and you can adjust that if your table has a bar, you can put like a, you know, a pad on the table to raise that patient up a little bit so you can get that image clear. But I think, you know, to be able to do something proficiently, you have to understand what you're looking at. And if you don't have a good view, you're not going to be able to be successful in this. Great, great point. Dennis, you're up. Um, I, you know, I think the pearl that I would throw out there is when can mild be utilized when vertiflex cannot? And, and I don't know if a lot of people have ever sat down and thought about that. Um, but as long as the patient has ligament flavum hypertrophy, 
Mild can be utilized over Hertaflex when they have L5 S1 disease. They've got severe uh, scoliosis where you can't line up uh, the spacer between um, spinous process. You've got a patient who has osteoporosis or a Z score that would probably make them prone to having a spinous process fracture. And then last but not least, just patient choice, somebody who doesn't want a piece of metal left behind in their spine. Oh, great, great, great uh, pearl. Alex, you the last pearl, and then we're gonna we're gonna end the session. All these pearls, it's hard to come up with a, a, a unique one. Um, I'd add to what Dr. Wiseben said uh, in terms of the epidurogram, you know, doing an initial diagnostic ESI for these patients and then saving that CLO view uh, is imperative. Uh, when you identify a, a actual buckling of the ligament, it is reproducible, and those patients seem to do far better than any other patient that I've seen. So when you're doing the CLO view, and if you see a classic thickening uh, of that ligament with buckling, those are, those are patients that are getting a mild procedure right when they leave. I think I'll give one more in that we can utilize this technique for bilateral uh, uh, spinal stenosis as well as multi-levels. And with the single access, we're able to treat multiple levels at the same time. Whereas with reimbursement changes, I think utilizing other options uh, may become more difficult. This is allowed to be you know, utilized in your hands. So it is effective as you allow it to be. Oh, great, great points. Uh, thank you all so much. It's, great I think job, it's, a, guys. it's a great session. Um, and uh, we really appreciate all three of you. Thanks so yeah. much. Fantastic job. With, you're up, Dawood, with next session. Yeah, great. So now we're going to pivot a bit and get into our Shark Tank session. So um, first, we're going to have the Biotros team uh, discussing their platform, which is really a cool and unique, innovative way to do hands-on training. Uh, Jennifer, please kick it off. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I don't have much of a presentation. I... I really more here as uh, the new gal in town and just I, I'm the creative person I'm not I'm not a doctor so you guys a lot of stuff goes over my head so anytime you have questions for me or requests of me what I want is um, just talk to me like you, I like you're talking to a patient is what I can ask for so um, I think Dr. Nelson and um, Stevens probably have a little more specific information about what their applications are with our models but i can say that just about if you can think it up most of the time i can try to recreate it so um, i'm excited that a lot of device companies have been in contact with us as far as creating new models here's what i mean. Jennifer, sorry to interrupt you. There's several people out there who may not know what you do. I mean, so, okay, sorry. So, could you go back to like kind of the basic level, what Biotrust is? Because I think really, you know, to a lot of folks, this is a brand new concept. Sure. So, uh, basic, we are simulated cadavers. Um, and the really cool thing about what our models, what our cadavers can do, is I can do specific parts. Uh, and we can always make sure that whatever ailment needs to be recreated over and over again for the sake of training can be recreated over and over again. You With a traditional cadaver, that's you, you never know um, what you're going to get, but with our models, it's consistent. It can be tailored specifically. It can be, I have pelvic models arms, legs, shoulders, uh, full torso, and we have recreated uh, the epidural space. So being able to practice procedures with um, within the epidural space, we've been able to recreate that, which is huge in, in, in the pain management world, obviously. And so that that's kind of in a nutshell what we do. Jennifer, I have a question. Can, sure. I have a question for you too. So I think a lot of this is, you know, what is the need for this? You know, and I've been doing uh, fellow teaching and a lot of other educational events for about ten years, and Tim's been doing it for twenty plus years, and we've used uh, human tissue and cadavers uh, quite successfully. What's sure. what's the what's the value add of using something like Biotros versus the standard 
standard what we've used for years and years and what are some of the you kind of mentioned some of the advantages to using you know using a biotrust model what are some of the disadvantages um or cost uh with with going how we've always went well gonna, um cut in. i'm sorry ahead. i apologize i was late i thought i wasn't on for a little bit so we're a bit early how are you dr nelson yeah <laughs> Join us. a little bit about how i use the models in, in uh, at the brain women's hospital in boston if you want to hear about that and then maybe jen can answer some other questions about costs so yeah, sorry, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> but i'm jump Aaron. on, jump on in there so over the past couple of years, I started this interventional pain simulation lab here at uh, Brigham Women's Hospital at Harvard Medical School in Boston. And so Biotrust donated a couple models so we can incorporate into training our fellows. We have a pretty big fellowship. We have 10 fellows a year, plus two to three pediatric pain fellows at Boston Children's Hospital who participate in our program and rotate through our sim lab. Um, and so I'll talk about a little bit about the simulation-based education that we've been developing. Uh, next slide. And so this is just one of the cadavers we use in our in our model in our uh, curriculum. Uh, next slide. So simulation-based education has been a long been around for a long time in, in the medical field. So it just can be defined as any device used to mimic a realistic patient interaction or experience. And so this all started maybe three decades ago, where the uh, anesthesiologist took tips from the aviation industry to create a crisis resource management system to integrate into their curriculum so that they can practice critical but rare scenarios. And over the past three decades, that's just expanded and used from like using simple mannequins to high fidelity interactive mannequins. And then now with so many subspecialties and advanced procedures and techniques, a lot of task simulators are available. And so those are available for um, angioplasty, interventional radiology, echocardiography, endoscopy, you can name it, there are tons out there, spinal cord stimulators, simulators. Um, and so it's becoming very common. And so we kind of took some notions from that and incorporated it into interventional spine using fluoroscopic spine-based procedures. And this is one of the models we're using. Uh, next slide. And so what this model is, is something that in medical simulation we call task simulation or part task simulation. So you use a focused part of the human body to serve as a model to teach a specific technique. So whether that's suturing, airway control, IV placements, angioplasty, it's just to train on specific, a specific technique for your learner or trainee. And there's lots of research that's been done over the past 20 years and even more coming out that show improvement in performance when you subject your trainees to some type of simulated environment or procedure. Next slide. Um, and so it gives our learners and trainees, so our fellows in this case, a chance to practice these procedures in a way that they can improve their skills. But it also gives us a mechanism to identify knowledge gaps and performance gaps. So this helps us create a curriculum and tailor it to fulfill those those deficiencies or gaps that we find in, in the trainees, whether they're residents or fellows. And as people present more data on using this type of simulation in their subspecialty fields, we're gaining some insight into how useful they might be as performance evaluation tools. It's kind of like a natural evolution of using simulation in medicine where you're just practicing, doing research, and then you kind of move up to tailoring the curriculum based on results from your sim labs, and then finally performance evaluations. Um, and so just a couple of things that we know from years of research it is three things that I incorporate into the sim sessions to make it more effective, and that's repetition. So giving them um, the opportunity to try these things over and over again, integration in some type of formal curriculum, and then the most important would be some type of debrief. So you have to, when you run a sim lab, you have to have a formal debrief session so the learner can review what they did, what they missed, and allow the instructors to help them identify those factors. And so, like I said, for the past three years, we've been developing this interventional pain simulation curriculum here at Harvard. And it's been an interesting process. And we use these biotrust models. That's why they asked me to, to speak tonight about kind of how we use them. Next slide. And so essentially, this is how one of our sim labs is set up. So for our fellows, we usually try to do four or five sim sessions early on in their fellowship year. So August, September, we try to get five sessions done 
covering basic bread and butter pain procedures. So TFSEs, interlaminar ESI, cervical and lumbar, um, cervical and lumbar RFL, sacral transferaminals, maybe some SI joint stuff too. And we try to get those done. So we just teach the basics, basic skill set, um, tips and tricks on how to perform this procedure, safety considerations, and radiation safety is a big component of what we teach too. Not only increase in fish efficiency of the fellows, but to reduce the radiation exposure that they, you know, subject their patients to and the staff who are training them. So for each individual session, the basic setup is uh, we haven't filled out a survey just to identify how many times they've performed a certain procedure, how comfortable they are. And then we bring them in the room and have them perform a procedure like they're a solo attending in the room when I'm on with a patient. And then we record objective metrics. So certain easy things to do are procedure time. So how long does it take them to perform a simple transferaminal ESI? And second is how much radiation do they use? How many pleural images are they taking? What's their pleural time? And what's the total radiation dose for that given procedure? And when they feel like they've completed the procedure, we do our formal debrief didactics. We give a lecture on you know, how we perform the procedures and then safety considerations and, and best practices. After all the fellows complete their first attempt at the procedure, they get to do it again. And then we compare how they do before and after. And we can compare those metrics. And then we have to fill out a survey afterwards. Next slide. And so, you know, as you might expect, letting fellows train on this um, will improve their, their scores and any metric that we, we use. So their procedure times go down, their number of x-rays they use goes down drastically and they increase their procedural accuracy. And depending on the, the, the degree of experience of the trainees, so we get fellows in August and September, some have never seen a, an S1 TFSE, some have seen it 100 times, um, but still universally the, they get better with, with these uh, simulation labs. And then on the subjective side, almost all of them enjoy, enjoy it. So 100% of them call it very helpful, helpful, and they all feel more comfortable, at least running through the sim lab for each of these given procedures. Next slide. And so not all of these procedures are amenable to kind of collecting data on how quickly they perform because it's just, it's just not efficient. So DRG is an example of something we're not going to let them come in and try to do a DRG lead. We would just all get rated and get canceled before anybody finishes fellowship. So we just set up skills labs where the fellows can come in. And we have two of these cadaver models and two floor rooms that we set up in our sim lab. And so we split the fellows up and then they all get a chance to get their hands on this device specifically because it's a little bit more technologically advanced or a little bit more complex than standard pain procedures, even than dorsal column stim. So they get a chance to use the, the you know, access to epidural space, use the introducer sheath, figure out the mechanics of the sheath and the lead and the stylet and when to lock, when to unlock, when to move the sheath. So all these mechanical things are are great for them to pick up and learn before they even get into the OR. So it's a little bit more streamlined. And plus they get a little stressed in the operating room because you know, there's OR time and you can't take three hours to do one stim. It just doesn't work that way. So they really appreciate that. And so these are these are a couple of pictures of that lab. You can go to the next slide. And this is us using the Biotrass cadaver model. So these are two different fellows putting an L1 DRG on the right side you know, putting the lead, the context under the pedicle and out into the neural foramen, throwing some loops up and down. Next slide. And one of the nice things is, you know, once they're done with the procedure, we can debrief and talk about how they did. And then we can pull up the skin and kind of just show the trajectory of the lead going through the interlaminar space or the epidural space. And on the lateral view, you can see it coming out of the dorsal root ganglion space so into the neural foramen. And so the fellows really, really appreciate that experience. And, you know, I'm an academic, so we do, we try to publish on everything we do. And so um, we don't collect objective data from these skills labs, but we do do surveys to get a sense for what the fellows feel about how the skills labs are helping their, their process to the fellowship. Do they find them helpful? Do they want to do more? And so we, we always collect this type of, type of information to help tailor our SIM curriculum going forward. So um, next slide, I think that's all I have. Just to kind of give you an overview of the same curriculum we've created, we do use the biotrust models, so I can answer some questions on how, you know, we use them. But um, yeah, so I, think, <clears throat> I think that was a great job. I, you know, I've never seen this model in person. I think it was really interesting to see you using it with fellow training. 
I remember early on the simulation models for anesthesia were very stressful. Uh, so this is a, a big advancement. Uh, how easy it is for this to, let's say for example, we wanted to train people during COVID, uh, during a, this pandemic, hopefully there won't be another one, although there was a bubonic plague case in California today. Dr. Chakrabarthy, I hope you're safe. Uh, mm -hmm. But but you know, can we can we move this model around from you know my practice and train a couple of people here, and then to Dr. Uh, to Dalwood's practice? Can is it easy to move this around, or does it need to be like a simulation lab like yours? They, I mean, so they're easy to move around. So actually, over the past couple of years, we've actually made suggestions on how to improve it, like creating the neural foramina. So we ship them back, and then they ship them back to us. So they're pretty easy. They're really heavy, okay. but they're easy to move around. They can be shipped around. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah. Krishnan, you have a question? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, this is maybe more of a perspective. Um, it was interesting, about a couple years ago, there was a push to make pain a separate residency program because there's an increasing number of uh, new skill sets. I, I, mean, I think one of the things is that, do you think that uh, Biotras and these kind of easier ways of accessing um, certainly models can help in uh, kind of developing better curriculums in the one year time frame that we have to train fellows. And I, we always get this in the academic center, you just feel that one year is never plenty of time. So, um, I mean, do you see this kind of becoming more of a mainstream academic use for training in the near future? And I certainly see something like this. So whether or not we incorporate some type of performance evaluation tool at the end of fellowship to, to pass certain metrics before they can be practicing pain positions, I think that's better for our specialty so that there are less complication rates. I think, yeah, I agree, one year to do this fellowship. Our fellows want to do research, but they don't have time because they have to learn so much psychiatry, so much physical exam, neurology. There are just so many things, not to mention all the new procedures that are coming out, like vertiflex and mild, in addition to STEM, and you're in doing pumps. That's a lot to learn for one, one year fellowship. So I think at least this can offload some of the numbers you're trying to get for procedures to have a sim lab set up like this and maybe some kind of structured performance evaluation would be something we could move to, to at least guarantee some um, competency of the fellows before they graduate. Interesting. Well, great job on this, uh, Dr. Nelson. I think this is really a unique way to train your fellows. And um, we're going to invite Dr. Stevens now to talk about how he uses Biotros in his practice. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. Great job. Can everybody hear me okay? We yes. can. All right, good. Sorry, we had a little bit of technical difficulty here. So uh, super excited to be on the call tonight. Thank you for asking me to be part of this and thank you to Biotrust for inviting me. And so I wanted to just talk a little bit about something I'm pretty passionate about and that is getting a chance to uh, teach labs to other doctors and try to kind of, as iron sharpens iron, work together to make each other better. I think there's a lot of good that comes from these labs we have. But sometimes having a lab can be a little bit uh, tenuous or a little bit troublesome. And so always looking for the best and easiest ways to uh, per perform a lab and get the results we're looking for as far as the training without having to make a big mess. So that's one thing that's pretty cool about this device. So next slide, please. So when you look at this, this little uh, breakdown here, when you look at what cadavers can do, we all know what they can do. We've been through medical school, right? And we know what we can expect when we have a cadaver. We know what, what, that there's a smell. We know that there's some other things that have to go along with that. But one thing that you don't think about maybe is when you're having a cadaver into your facility, you're potentially going to be inviting disease into your facility. And so, especially in light of the COVID and some of the things that serology testing and other things that have to be done in order to get a, a cadaver into a facility, it may you know, slow down your lab or your ability to perform a lab. And so Biotrust offers some other things that, that, that will help you there. So you've got these anatomical reproductions in a way that you can teach somebody very easily without having to make a large mess and have a lot of cleanup. And so these can be customized, which is the one of the stars here. These don't have to require medical storage. They have no smell, which again, we, we all went to medical school. We know everybody at church knew how we smelled when we walked in. And there's, they can be shown on a C arm and easily demonstrate a procedure. So very good uh, alternative for training. Next slide. 
So when you look at this, this is a company that's founded out of Dallas, Texas, which um, I'm a little partial to since I'm in South Lake near there. But John East is a, is a doctor who thought this was a reasonable way to train. And so the mission of Batros is to revolutionize the didactic cadaver training by enhancing physician expertise and reducing training costs. We all know that there is a large amount of expenditure in all these labs that we go to every weekend. And we know that by going to these labs and teaching other colleagues, we're going to make them better physicians and we're gonna help more people, but there's cost involved and there's, there's effort involved in getting that cadaver to the facility. And then again, we have the serology testing that has to be done. And then just the fear some facilities have of bringing a cadaver into their facility. And so this takes away a lot of those issues. This is a uh, training system that simulates anatomy in a sense that you can have all the way up to actual bone over with a gel topping over the top, or you can have a artificial bone, but either one can simulate the procedure well enough for a doctor, as you've already heard from a uh, administrative uh, training standpoint in a academic center, that you can use these to train your physicians to do procedures and it can be done reproducibly. Next slide. So these are just a list of a few things that we can do with this. And so this is kind of the entirety of, of my practice and most of your practices. So anything as simple as an epidural injection all the way through doing this last past weekend, we did a um, SI joint fusion course and we were able to use the device for that. I remember the first time they told me they were going to come train me and they were going to use this device. And I thought it was kind of comical. And then we put it underneath the fluoroscope and the anatomy was very realistic. And I was able to train in a few minutes in my office and clean up in about two minutes. And it was really awesome for that standpoint. And then we're training people this weekend on it. So some doctors are a little worried about coming into these labs, being with other colleagues and things of this nature right now. And maybe some people are a little afraid of being around a cadaver. This takes away that concern. So you can even do treatments like um, more advanced interventional procedures, such as the interspinous spacer placements that we've talked about. Um, the SI fusions, the decompressions, interdiscal injections, radiofrequency ablation, and the anatomical model can be accurate enough to give you the same kind of feeling you have going through tissue and then getting onto bone and or, you know, between bone, whatever the case may be. So I was a little skeptical, I'll be honest, when I started using these, but now with the ease of, of use, along with the reproducible good results we're seeing, and patients being able to get helped, even though we have kind of a pandemic going on, uh, become a believer. So this has been a great addition to my practice. Next slide. So I think we already mentioned that you can actually see pretty well with your C-arm and ultrasound and even MRI imaging with these. And it looks very anatomically uh, accurate. It's remarkable how accurate it is. And uh, I like to give a little bit of feedback here and there. I'm on their advisory committee and can give them some feedback about things I think would work better. But by and large, the bone anatomy you're working with is very easy to visualize, very easy to place needles and or cannulas on. And I think you'll find that your doctors, your training will feel that it's very much um, satisfactory as far as then going on and treating real patients, and just as if they had been treating cadavers over the weekend and go on to real patients. So I think it's a good alternative for us to be looking for in the future, especially as medicine evolves. And what we're seeing now is our very large training centers and labs are becoming smaller and more regional and more local. And maybe this is a way to have our trainings and still have effective you know, uh, expertise for our, our other doctors without having to go and, and you know, rent a cadaver and make a big deal at some surgery center. Next slide. So this is just some different things. You can see a person in the upper corner using it for a kyphoplasty technique. You got next to him is, is doing an SI joint fusion. And you can see all these people standing around and you can see in the bottom left corner there, that's what the anatomy looks like. It's very realistic. It is very well represented with the C-arm and it gives the doctor the sensation that they're performing the procedure. And I think that you'll find that with the ability to melt these down and make new ones, you can reproducibly make the anatomy the way you want it. You can alter it by making a disc herniation if you want it one time and not another time. You can make an SI joint tighter or you can make it more distracted. There's a lot of different things you can do by giving suggestions back to the company. Next slide. So again, this is just a really nice model here that shows you some actual hardware inside of this back. And you can see this looks extremely realistic. 
And um, when you're when you're working on some of the procedures we do on cadavers, you don't always get the perfect cadaver. Sometimes you get a person that's got some anatomical variants, which make teaching a little more difficult. And so you can either simulate more difficult cases and show people how to get around some of the struggles they might have, or in some cases you can go and and you can um, put this hardware in there just to give them a chance to see what it would look like to work your way around it and go underneath it or over it. And so I think that's a nice uh, adjustment you can make. If you want your nerves to be large and you know, can, in, involved in touching the other tissue and structures within the facet or the foramen, you can do that. You can put these uh, pedicle screws in. And so you have an option to even create a scoliotic spine because we all know that we don't get perfect spine patients when we do a procedure. So I think you can kind of custom make your patient. And as we all know, anybody who teaches that's on this panel, everybody that does this, you've gone in and you've seen a cadaver and known right away, it's gonna be difficult for the people you're proctoring to complete the procedure on it. So you know what you're getting into with this, you get into this procedure and you can already know ahead of time any downfalls or pitfalls you might have. So I think that's another advantage. Next slide. So this is just me this weekend, and you can see a picture of the, of the sacrum we worked on. Um, obviously, we were wearing masks and we were social distancing and doing all the important COVID requirements. But you can see that this is a cannula that's easily sticking in, into that gel and staying in place as if it's human tissue. And so I was a little skeptical of that again, uh, but you can actually ask them to make that harder and make it more taut so that you can hold instruments in place. So there's a lot of variations you can do with this. And I think you'll find if you start to add this to your fellowships or to your training programs, that your doctors will be getting great training without a lot of the mess and a lot of the tr struggles of getting the cadaver in the building. So give it a look, give it a try. I think you'll be pleased. And uh, I hope everybody on the webinar gets a chance to get their hands on one of these models soon. Thank you very much for having me on tonight. Chad, great job. Uh, certainly enjoyed your insights. I have just a quick question for you. Um, yes, you know, I recently had a, a case where I was teaching something to some really high trained people and uh, it turned out the cadaver was still frozen in the epidural space, which we didn't realize at first, but it made it very difficult. I, I initially thought their skills was a great, turns out the cadaver was still frozen. So uh, they were very skilled people and they did a great job later in the day as an unthought. So I do see the value of this. Um, and I enjoyed your presentation and that of your colleagues. The question I have for you is, what's the negative about this? There's got to be a negative. I mean, you both present a lot of positives. Uh, tell me the negative. So, I mean, one one negative is just like any cadaver. Once you've already, uh, you know, uh, gone into the tissue or gone into the bone, you have to replace it with another one, right? And so it takes a minute to, to change out. Like in this case, we had to change out the rear and uh, find another rear. And um, But just very simple, you know, in, in a lot of times when we're doing that in the lab, you know, we have to go find another sp frozen specimen, bring it in, thaw it out a little bit, and then we have to wait a minute. This is a, just an immediate, you you set it on the table, remove the other one, put it on the table, and you're ready to go. So I don't really see a lot of downside to that. Um, I don't really have a downside to say. I haven't run into anything yet where the anatomy wasn't real enough feeling that I could do it. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about tonight, spinal simplicity. I also had a, a model like that that I trained on um, initially for that. Again, during COVID, it was a little bit easier to do little local trainings than it was to meet in big groups like we're accustomed to, Tim. And so um, that would be the only negative I think there is. And then the other thing is maybe if you're teaching your other fellows or your other doctors something specifically, you might through time learn how you want your cadaver to be made so that you can make those uh, physical differences and, and manifestations so that you can teach them a more specific approach or something. Perfect. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, sure. any other questions before we move on to spinal simplicity? I think of Chad, I think we're, I think this is going to be the Chad Stevens show tonight. So we're enjoying it. So uh, now spinal simplicity is up and I think you're, you're up for that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Great job. Thank you, Thank you so, so much. Appreciate it. Great Thanks job, Chad. So Thank our, you. our second uh, think tank session will be spinal simplicity and we'll have uh, Dr. Mosley, who's CEO, or not Dr. Mosley, but Todd Mosley, who's CEO and co-founder, as well as Dr. Hochschuler and Dr. Stevens, who's on our last panel. Gentlemen, please. Dr. Sayed, Dr. Deer, thank you guys so much for having me on. I'm Todd Mosley, CEO and co-founder of Spinal Simplicity, and just want to say, I don't know that I would ever, ever actually be here at this point in time if it wasn't for your all's invite last December to your meeting in Scottsdale. So, Thank you guys. You kind of opened our eyes to um, uh, a market that um, 
we probably underestimate it, and uh, I could not be happier to be here at this point in time, so thank you so much. Spinal Simplicity is a revenue stage company. We have three FDA clearances to date, as well as our CE mark and our Health Canada approval. We've developed a proprietary solution for lumbar fusion. We have 75 patents issued, an additional 25 patents pending. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Spinal Simplicity is a medical device company founded focused on the design, development, and commercialization of innovative spinal and orthopedic implants, founded in 2008 by my partner, Dr. Harold Hess, and myself. Our vision is to be the global leader in innovative, simplified surgical solutions. Our mission is to provide exceptional value to our patients, our physicians, and our payers. And the values that drive our company every day are integrity, patient first, relentless pursuit of perfection, and teamwork. Next slide, please. <clears throat> A little bit about our um, advisors and our, well, here's our management team. So I've spent my whole career in the med device space the last 32 plus years. I exited my last company, built it a little over 60 million before I exited to focus on spinal simplicity full time. My partner, Dr. Harold Hess, is my co-founder, neurosurgeon, <clears throat> and co-inventor of the technology. John Hess is my VP of Business Development and Director of Finance. John has literally held every position in the company, including my own. He's our first employee. Melissa Frock is our director of engineering, has been an absolute rock star for us. Roger Yap, um, most recently was senior VP of sales at Nuvasiv. We're thankful to have Roger on board. He's got 25 plus years experience bringing new technologies to the market. Next slide. This is our advisors and our consultants. I also like to talk about this as our exit team. Uh, Dr. Uh, Brad Paddock has most recently been president of Striker Spine Division. Before that, he was VP of Sales at Kaifon. Charlie Federica most recently was Chairman of the Board of Mako Surgical. He orchestrated that $1.6 billion acquisition by Stryker from his company. Gary Henley, um, uh, he's been CEO of Worthifix, been CEO of Wright Medical, uh, pre past president and CEO of uh, United Orthopedic Group. Uh, Gary may be one of the most sought after board members and, and all of orthopedics and spine. Thankful to have him on board. Rich Grant, you guys probably know his product or seen it around the hospital, but it's the O-Arm. So Rich developed, he was the CEO of Breakaway Imaging. He sold his product, uh, the O-Arm, to Medtronic. I think Medtronic sold another $850 million of his product since then. Next slide, please. A little bit about our technology. So the Minuteman <clears throat> is a minimally invasive interspinous interlaminar fusion device. It's intended for immediate rigid uh, stabilization of the lumbar spine. It fixates to the spinous process, providing immediate uh, stability. <clears throat> it's most appropriate for uh, L1 through L5 with this G3R version, and it's intended for use with bone graft material. The implant is coated with hydroxyapatite. We were the first company in the spine to get HA FDA clear for this application, and it just really aids you in getting an immediate rigid fixation because bone adheres to it very quickly. There's some fusion images on the far right, the image on the bottom right is from our European device, um, our first generation product. Next slide. And so now I'm gonna introduce Dr. Stephen Hochschuler. Uh, he's our uh, co-founder of the Texas Back Institute. He's been an orthopedic spine surgeon for 40 plus years. I, I, there's no way I could list out his bio. He's also a US military veteran, a major in US Air Force. His contributions uh, to spine are enormous. You can't go anywhere in the world and uh, not run into someone that knows Dr. Hochschiller. So with that, I'll let him take it away. Thank you. Dr. Hochschiller, are you there? Well, I guess I'll go keep going and see if the, the good doctor joins us. But um, so a little bit about our design of our implant. So that threaded body gives you a huge mechanical advantage over the space. So when you lock that down, uh, it's comparable to four pedicle screws and two rods. So the <clears throat> the best claim an example of that is a scissor jack on a car that you can lift a 4,000 pound car with a scissor jack. And very similar to this a mechanical advantage you gain with the threaded body it gives you uh, huge advantage over the space. You can also notice we have a large graft window. So our implant uh, will hold majority of time more graft material than uh, the typical T-lift cages on the market. Next slide, please. So in the, cl the clinical side, 
we've had um, a multi-center trial in the UK. So we're getting some feedback there. So this study, uh, we should have the full abstract from it, first full year results, but basically we compared our device going to learn what photograph material to a full surgical decompression and open lung and open lung. I don't know if you guys can hear that feedback, sorry about that. And what the paper is showing is that, um, you know, our initial goal was that we would show equivalence to the gold standard, which is the full surgical decompression open laminectomy. We're, we're actually showing superiority to that. We've had no reoperations or in our group. There's been several reoperations in the, in the full surgical decompression open laminectomy paper. We also have a paper, um, we compared 100 of our uh, patients to 100 uh, Coflex F devices, and Dr. Professor Alexander did that study for us. So next slide, please. So in the UK, in that clinical um, trial, it showed a dramatic reduce, reduction in surgical time, uh, length of stay, and blood loss. So the blood loss in this procedure is averaging about five cc's, about a bottle cap full of blood. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the paper that I was referring to. We, we compared our device, Dr. Alexander did, Professor Alexander, 100 Minute Man to 100 Coflex, showed about an 86% fusion rate with the Minute Man device, that the patients returned to activity much faster than they did in the Coflex um, study overall. Next slide, please. So a little bit about our pipeline of technology. Uh, we're certainly not a one trick pony. <clears throat> We're recently developed a product um, for C1 fixation, so it'll take the place of having to place lateral mass screws at C1, and then that a doctor could easily attach a 3.5 posterior rod and screw set with that device. We have a cervical plate based off Wolf's Law technology, and that simply states that if you stress bone, obviously bone re, um, reacts by laying down additional bone. This plate provides full-time active compression, almost 12 pounds of load, 24-7 until it's fused. We can take that same technology and place it in uh, foot and ankle plates as well. And at the far left is our European version of our Minuteman, which, which soon is going to be available in the U.S. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. S um, Dr. Stevens now. I think you guys were just with him, but uh, he's going to walk you through the Minuteman procedure. Okay, I'm back. So those of you that know me know that I get a little passionate about things I'm talking about. What we're looking at here is a device that has an indication for spondylolisthesis, degenerative disc disease, and or trauma and tumor. We're going to show you just a little video that's already playing, obviously. But what you're looking at here is your spinous processes posteriorly, and you want to go down to the spinal laminar junction with the guide wire. That's what you're seeing happen here. You'll notice that the supraspinous ligament or interspinous ligament is not uh, damaged in any way. The device goes through the anterior third or so of the interspinous ligament there. And you can see that you have a series of dilators that you put in followed by this tissue rasp. And then this is the tap. And this is how you decide what size you're going to use, the 8, 10, 12, 14, and so on. And it's very simple to place in. Once you decide on your implant, just like any other implant you put in, it's just it's just putting the device in. So you'll see this now. One thing we really strive to do with this, we try to make sure that we get the, the device put in as anteriorly as we can, as close to the spinal lamar junction as we can, to give the patient the best fixation and the strongest part of the bone. And those of you who have done studies with other products know that that's the strong part of the bone. And so there's a few little fine niceties you do to do some twisting to get the device to bring the two uh, spike plates together around the spinous process. And this little this little device is, is so cool. It's it's kind of heavy and it's fun to hold in your hand and then kind of twist and it makes you feel like you're doing something. And then you go through and, and once you've deployed the whole device, you release it and you're done. That's what it looks like. So what I want to impress to you is a little story. Basically, the reason we have meetings like this and the reason we're all into this is because when we get on the phone together, we get in a webinar together, we meet in a, in, a, in a setting where we can learn from one another, what happens is we grow together. And so uh, one, of the, one of the members of Aspen, Doug Beal, reached out to me and said, hey, Chad, you've got to meet this, this company. You've got to try this product. And the story went on that I got a hold of Todd and Roger, and Todd came out and trained me. 
And it was so impressive to me that the CEO came out and actually trained me himself. At first time, I gotta be honest with you, I was a little bit, I thought it was kind of weird. I thought it was a little, I was a little nervous as guys coming out. But then when I realized that this guy invented the device and could put it in faster than any physician on the face of the earth, I decided that maybe I should listen to him. And so as we started doing this, I wanted to buck uh, two different um, rumors about this. Number one, I, I thought for about five seconds before I did it because I heard it was too difficult. And within the first case I did that was in just around 20 minute time frame, I realized that is not necessarily a true rumor. And at least so far in my hands, it hasn't been difficult to get in a time where I'm consistent with other procedures that are similar. Number two, the, this rumor is that it's really hard to place the device laterally. Now, I'll be honest, it's the first device I've ever placed laterally, but after doing it in a cadaver and, and those on the panel, you know, Dawood had a case today and I know Tim has been trained in doing these and, and you guys, you, you know what I'm talking about. Once you've placed that guide wire in, it's just handing dilator over dilator, right? I mean, we could teach a medical student to do this once they get the guide wire placed. And so the rumor that it's a difficult procedure is wrong and the rumor that it takes a long time is wrong. A couple of things you need to know about, Dr. Abrani is a, a well-known name who has got an opinion about this. He said, we found this new and innovative Minuteman device very promising. We have reasonable experience with the interspinous distraction devices. The Minuteman has been very different due to the ability to form a fusion. I think we all understand the significance of that. It allows us to do the treatment of a, a lesion or a level where there is a, a spondylolisthesis or a slip. And I think that we know of, of limitations with other things we use because of that instability of the lumbar spine. And we wanna do the very best thing we can for our patients to give them the best outcome the shortest uh, amount of time. So Minuteman's advantages, according to Dr. Barani, are short surgical time, like I've already alluded to. There's minimal surgical pain, which I've found to be the case, minimal blood loss, short hospital stays. We're doing these outpatient. The patients are leaving 30 minutes after their case is over. So far, I've found the effective reduction in pain that he's talking about. And then what we've got is some data that Todd already alluded to that said that this is equivalent to the strength of rods and screws. And we all know people that fuse with rods and screws reproducibly. So why not do something? That My question to the people I talk to is, what do you do the rest of your day? If you're used to taking an hour and a half to do a fusion, what about being done in 30 minutes? What are you going to do? Go golf? Go guns? I mean, figure out a hobby. Go Heck, go see your wife for, and reintroduce yourself. You know what I mean? So there's, there's, it's a quick procedure with lots of good results. Next slide. I mentioned Doug earlier. Doug is one of those guys that I consider to be a mentor for life. Doug and I met many years ago, and I don't take very many steps without talking to Doug Beal. And I think that's true of everybody that's on this panel and a lot of people that are on this call. Um, he's, he's a grandfather to us. He's not that much older than us, but he's, he, is, he is well known to be somebody who tries things out and is very ethical in his approach to medicine. And so when Doug called me and said, Chad, I got something for you. Whenever he does that, it translates into, I'm gonna be doing this for a long time and a lot of them. And Doug's take on this is Minuteman is revolutionary technology, allows the fusion stability through a minimally invasive lateral approach that produces surprisingly little post-operative pain. My patients are in and out a very little time, achieve post-operative improvement almost immediately. Everybody that's on this call knows that Doug doesn't, doesn't fabricate results, right? He does multiple procedures, does multiple paper writing, and he comes out and gives people the, the honest truth. So we have the placement of the ventral, the supraspinous ligament is key for stability, and the implantation kit makes it easy for use. The Minuteman is one of those devices that after you use it, you can't imagine not having it. So the next slide. So there's some highlights here. I think Todd's alluded to some of them. By the way, um, Todd's uh, humility is is ridiculous. So I'm trying to learn from him, but um, just just having a CEO who has brought this to market and who can do this procedure, and yet every room I have him go into, they talked about his humility. It's a real blessing to work with a, with a company like this. And so if there are people out there that want to get trained on this, man, it's time. Part of this talk tonight is to say, Forget about the rumors out there and get busy doing this procedure. Your patients need you. Your patients want you to do this. And it's well within the scope of your training and your capability to do this. And so there's clinically validated eight years of successful outcomes. There's 75 patents issued 
And believe me, Todd's, when he's not thinking, he's thinking. And when he's not sleeping, he's thinking because he's got lots of ideas. There's a lot of uh, people that have been you know, opinion leaders for them that have already voiced their opinion. I'm becoming a big fan of this product myself. And I think those of you on the panel that have done it would agree that this is going to be one of those things. We have all different tiers of pain doctors' skill sets. And I think this is gonna be something that everybody's capable of doing, but some people are a little intimidated of. But I wanna encourage you to get the training. I'll come train you or somebody will train you to get you up to speed so you can effectively and safely do this procedure. Because again, you have a lot of patients out there that need this. There's patients that are getting other treatments that, that may not work as well as this might. And I mean that, you know, big fusions with, with uh, longer recovery times and things of that nature. So I would encourage those who are on the call to learn more about this device and get busy doing it. Next slide. That is our final slide. And I'm speaking about Biotros again, it looks like. So thank you so much for having us on the call tonight. I really appreciate the time and attention. And I just wanna encourage you guys that these two things I talked about are things you need to add to your, your regimen of, of what you're treating patients with so that you have more tools in your bag and you can get patients better faster. Todd and Chad, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Dr. Stevens, thank you all so much. That was really insightful. I think uh, Dr. Stevens, you're a little bit um, humble. I do believe that the, putting this, the pen in is the initial skill that you have that, that based on all the years of experience you have. But I do think we can train fellows and residents to do this procedure quite safely. Before we close, I think Dr. Dawood Said has a question for Dr. Hochschuler. So Dawood, yeah, I think you have that question. Dr. Hochschuler, I don't know if you've, uh, sorry for the technical difficulties. Are you with us? Am, but I can't. <laughs> you have me muted. Oh, we can hear you. Okay, we can now hear. I'm un unmuted. Good. Now I've been <laughs> here all along. I don't know what the problem was, but I thought the presentation was fantastic without me. So you really didn't need me. I would only say this I think, as being a spine surgeon and one of the first out there, I think things are shifting in the spine world, just like cardiovascular way back when. And so the shift is really gonna be away from the surgeon to the interventionalist. And you guys are the interventionalists. Any argument that people have, and you know, Vertiflex asked me to help them, I didn't really like what they had, to be honest with you. I'm not here bashing anybody. I like the fact this is interlaminar, it's low. I like the fact that I'm told none have, has had to be retrieved. I like the fact that this is not just an interspinous or interlaminar device, but it's a fusion. I like that it's fast. I like that it's safe. And any arguments anybody would have that an interventionalist should not be doing this, they're crazy. You guys put in dorsal column stimulators, you put in pain pumps, this is much safer than either of those procedures. So all I would say is I rarely join other groups now helping with a project in terms of new technology. I'm usually looking way downstream. So now I'm looking at regenerative medicine, rolling up uh, all sorts of telemedicine phenomena. I helped Harvard set up telemedicine 40 years ago. I was 40 years too early. So you <laughs> can be too early. <laughs> but right now, it's not too early for any of these things. And minimally invasive spine surgery, as you well know, is the way to go. No, thank you very much for those kind words. And we apologize that uh, we muted you earlier. But uh, with all the innovative things you've been uh, involved in, we, we hope to invite you to our think tank next year to present uh, to some of this other interesting work that you've been doing. So really appreciate that. And we really appreciate your insight as a spine surgeon weigh weighing in on some of the political battles that we will be fighting as we adopt these therapies. Just like Washington, forget the politics, do what's right. <laughs> Thank I love you, that. Sir. Yeah, we're honored to have you tonight. So thank you for those comments. It really means a lot to all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. There you go, guys. You got the blessing from a, a well-known, renowned spine surgeon to say it's okay for pain doctors to operate. Don't be afraid. Let's do it. Oh. All right. Well, well thank you very much. Well, Dawood, I think it's time to, to wrap up the session. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, this was really uh, a great uh 
five part session. You know, again, unfortunately, we're not able to to do this as originally planned in the Bahamas, but I think we really did uh, the next best thing. So thank you, everyone. We look forward to having everyone uh, together again in this similar format in September at our annual meeting, and then hopefully an in person meeting sometime soon in the springtime. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. I'm Dr. Tim Deer. And I'm Dr. Dawood Syed. And we're excited to be hosting the American Society of Pain and Neurosciences annual virtual conference, broadcast live from Nashville, Tennessee on September 